Before we get into the Word this morning, let's just uh, spend a moment in prayer together. Father God, we thank you for this time of being together. And Lord, we, we hold your Word in our hands and we, we look into it and we try to understand that which is so difficult for us to understand, a place called heaven. And we want to answer some questions. We want to try to apply them to our lives this morning. And Lord, we just want to give you this time. Lord, we, we realize that when we open the Word, or we study, we read the Word of God, we never come to the Word of God without a backdrop. There's always things that are happening in our lives. And some of the people even today who are with us are struggling with life. They're struggling with relationship. They're struggling with finances. And they're struggling with just conflict, interpersonal challenges, emotional challenges, mental health challenges. And Lord, we want to just pray that you would set these things aside. And Lord, may we just be drawn into to your word, drawn into your presence. And Lord, speak to us. May we leave this place different people. May we leave this place better uh, prepared and more passionate about the place that we're going to go to be with, one, be with you one day in heaven one day with. And I just want to pray that that would be our, our goal this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I read about a guy whose name was R.G. Lee. And R.G. Lee was this pastor. He's passed away. But he was the pastor of a very large church down in the South. Actually, many of you may know uh, the pastor Adrian Rogers. Uh, pastor R.G. Lee was the pastor previous to Adrian Rogers. Godly man, great preacher, preached on everything that the Bible contained during his his many decades of ministry. But people said that when he spoke on heaven, when he preached about heaven, there was something special that took place. I, I've never was able to listen to any of his sermons, but as I read, people said it was like when he preached, he was so articulate in being able to, to share what the Bible said heaven was like, that the people in the audience who heard his message felt like they were tasting it themselves. They felt as if they were there with the Lord. And they loved it when he preached on heaven because he just had this great insight. Well, as he aged, it, the time drew near for uh, R.G. Lee to, to die himself and go home to heaven himself. And in those last moments, he was on his deathbed and he gathered they gathered around with his family and his friends and it was a sweet time uh, they would read scripture about heaven they would sing songs about heaven they would pray and they had this very special time and and uh, this old pastor who had been so faithful to preach the word all these years was slipping in and out of consciousness and not always communicating just kind of there and he was in a state of, of unconsciousness, it appeared, but all of a sudden, he sat up in the bed and, and he shouted, there it is, I can see it, and I did not do it justice. And then he sat back, he closed his eyes, and he slipped into eternity. When I hear stories like that, something inside my being can't wait to find out what heaven is like. Sometimes I hear songs and I love different, especially gospel songs. I know I'm an old guy and I love those songs. And many of them talk about heaven and I, I can just be enraptured with thoughts of heaven. And I, I can't wait to, to, to figure out, to see what it's going to be like. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever long for that place called heaven? There's probably no person, no human being, who's more qualified to talk about heaven than the Apostle John. A remarkable guy. Last week we were looking at John in the Gospel of John that he wrote. Where, where Jesus was speaking about a promise of heaven. And last week, I'm going to put it on the screen to just kind of remind you, we learned this thing that heaven is a real place prepared by God to be with his people forever. 
And John was there when Jesus was talking in John 14. But John did not just get to hear about the promise of heaven. John got to see a preview of heaven. Uh, Many of you uh, back in the day before COVID maybe went to the movie theater. And one of the things that um, people, you go in there and you sit down and before the movie starts, they show previews of coming attractions. Now, some of you hate this, right? Some of you think, man, I just show up a little late and I'll get in there and those previews are over. But others of you think, man, there's some movies that are coming out. I want to see the preview. I want to see the preview. Well, let me tell you, Jesus gave John a preview of heaven. And, And he said, I want you to write it down. And we get to chapters 21 and 22 of Revelation. We have it written down. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and open your Bibles if you would like. We're going to have it on the screen as well. To Revelation chapter 21. And we're going to begin with verse 1. And you can follow along. We're going to spend the whole morning here in chapter 21 of Revelation. Here we go. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Now, we are not going to talk this morning about why it's new, as you see that word on the screen. You're going to have to come back in the next couple of weeks to find out why it's new. But all I can tell you is it's that it's good, okay? There you go. He says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Yes. (laughs) He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Amen? Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have, say it out loud, passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things, say it out loud, new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So what did John do? John wrote them down. Chapters 21 and 22 is what he saw in heaven. Now, it is very important for us to remember that when we, have, when we read the Word of God, God inspired men to write these words down. So God is inspiring these men, but God used the, the personality of the writer. He used the intellect, the, the volition. He le- used the vo- vocabulary of these men who would write down these words that you and I just, just read. Now, When John wrote this, he's writing with first century vocabulary. Now, what's that mean? John didn't have a vocabulary. We we have a bigger vocabulary today. We've added some words to our dictionary since, since John wrote this. But John is using first century vocabulary. And he is going to be talking about and explaining some things he's never seen before. He didn't completely understand. And there's no words in his first century vocabulary for him to even to use but he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he has been allowed to see into heaven and he's going to use his intellect his vocabulary to to write down what he what he saw and even let me just say even with his limited vocabulary you and I just sit back and go wow wow Now, when we look down, we're not going to get there today, but when we look down at verse 16 of chapter 21, we find out that there's this city in heaven. And this city in heaven is 1,500 miles long 
and 1,500 miles wide and 1,500 miles tall. Now, just to give you a little perspective, uh, this, this is not all of heaven. This is just the hub of heaven, if you will. This is where the uh, main operations take place. And, and that is, uh, actually, if you were to see how long that is, that is from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, all the way down to Tijuana, as actually not even 1,500 miles. It's a little bit more than that if you wanted to go further into Mexico to get there 1,500 miles. It would be like standing in San Francisco and going all the way to Nashville, Tennessee. And on top of that, it is 1,500 miles tall. This is the city, this is the main hub of heaven. Now, not only that, we keep reading and we find out that there are gates of pearl that are in heaven. Ready? We're going to get into that later on. I'm not going to spoil that. Now, a lot of times we, we hear stories and jokes about the, the pearly gates. You probably have heard thousands of them, you know, hundreds of them. Maybe you've got one that you like to tell about the pearly gates. Uh, I'm demonstrating great self-control this morning by not telling you one right now, okay? Okay. But when we hear the pearly gates, we think of a gate, there are gates in heaven, and each of these gates are covered with lots and lots of little pearls. That's not what the Bible says. It actually says it is a gate of a pearl. Every gate is a singular pearl. Can you imagine that? We're not going to even talk about that today. What we're trying to get into today is we're progressing in our series and uh, we're in a series that is called Heaven, Questions You Wish You Had Answered. And we are going to take another step today in answering some questions. Now, next week and beyond, we're going to talk about what's in, in heaven. But as I read through and spent some time studying, looking at Revelation 21, I want to talk today about what is not going to be in heaven. And I think it's important for us to understand what's not going to be in heaven. And the first thing we see that is not going to be in heaven is there's going to be no separation. I want you to look at that verse that's on the screen. And the sea, we read this earlier, and the sea was no more. Now, I mean, th that just kind of puzzles me. I mean, that, that's the first thing that John notices. I mean, we got a city that's 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles by 1,500 miles. We've got streets of gold. We've got gates that are uh, uh, big pearls. I, this, and he's mentioning that there's no sea. I mean, I'm sure that's significant, I would think, but that would not be on my list of things. I mean, God says, hey, hey, John, come into heaven, take a look. And the first thing he mentions is, is that there's no sea. I think I would have moved that down a little list, further down the list. But why did John say it first? Well, let's remember the context. Let's remember the context from which John is writing this. There's... There were 12 disciples, right? 12 disciples. One of them died, took his own life. It was Judas. Ju Judas, after he betrayed Christ, he had some remorse and he actually hung himself. He took his own life. So he died that way. Ten of the disciples, they were executed for proclaiming and preaching the gospel. They were given the choice to, to deny Christ, to deny that Jesus was the only way, as we learned last week, or die, and they all chose death. But one of them died of natural causes. The ten were executed. John is the only one who died of old age. Now, in case you think he got a complete pass, he didn't. John was the one who was actually thrown into a cauldron of boiling oil at one point, persecuted for his faith, for proclaiming the gospel. And then he was taken and exiled on an island of Patmos where he wrote this book of Revelation. Now, this book, this island rather, is called the Isle of Patmos, was only six miles wide at its widest point. And it was 10 miles long at its longest point. Think about John's existence. 
day after day. Six miles, 12 miles, that's it. Think how day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, John is separated from his family and friends. I can imagine him going down, perhaps to the surf, putting his feet into the water, gazing out over the sea and wondering, I wonder what life's on the other side. I wonder what life is like with all the people I love and everything I know and love back home, separated. That sea is a symbol of separation. I believe that John would reminisce about what was on the other side of that sea. And Jesus says, John, I'm going to give you a glimpse into heaven. And I want you to write what captures your eye, what catches your eye. And John looks and the first thing he sees is that there are no more seas. Do you know what he saw when he looked into heaven? He saw people. There's no more separation. People of all ages and all races and everybody together celebrating and fellowshipping and no more separation. There's this reunion in heaven. No more separation. This morning, I can't help but think that there are many of you who are listening in who likewise stand on the sea separated from loved ones who have passed away. And you wonder what life is like. There's a spouse, a parent, a child, a close friend. And maybe this morning you feel alone. You feel this great separation. But I want want you to hear me this morning. Heaven is a place where there is no separation. It, heaven is this place of reunion with all the saints of history, with all the people that are near and dear to us. I, I love what, what Jonathan Edwards wrote. He said this, Every Christian friend that goes before us from this world is a ransom spirit waiting to welcome us into heaven. There is the Christian father and mother and wife, and child, and friend, with whom we shall renew the holy fellowship of the saints, which was interrupted by death here, but shall be commenced again in the upper sanctuary, and then shall never end. There we shall have companionship with the patriarchs, and fathers, and saints of the Old and New Testaments, and those of whom the world was not worthy. Let me give you an application here. Heaven will be a place of being together. Heaven will be a place of being together. (laughs) Sometimes when our children are little, it feels and seems like we are always together. Any parents of small children tuning in today? Matter of fact, sometimes you wonder if you'll ever be alone again. There's always these kids running around, right? But guess what? They grow up, they leave the house, and they have their own lives of their own one day. There's a whole lot of time when we're being together and we get so much of it. But one day, and I've learned this, we long to be back together again. One of the greatest things that we have as human beings is when we have good family relations. We love that time. We love to get together. We have a meal together. And the meal is fun. Oh, it's good when mom cooks something or somebody has a special recipe. Oh, that's good stuff. But what makes it meaningful, what makes it joyful is who's around the table. And God made us to want to be together. What makes heaven so special is that we're going to be together with each other never to be separated again a couple weeks last month i should say doug 
bishop preach, and he preached on Hebrews 11, this, this, uh, this hall of faith, this hall of fame of faith, this, all these different believers. And do you know all those guys are going to be with us? Those men and women, they'll be with us. We'll be together. No more separation. Okay, let's keep moving. I could just settle in right here, but let's keep moving. What else is not going to be in heaven? Here's another one. There'll be no death and pain in heaven. Look what the verse 4 says. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Anybody, anybody here have a bad day? Anybody have a bad decade or maybe even a bad life? Hey, let me just tell you something. I love what Tony Evans says. He says this, All of the things that make life difficult will be wiped away in heaven. Amen. All the things that make life so hard, so challenging, so frustrating, they're, they're going to be gone in heaven. The story of this book from Genesis all the way to Revelation is a story of God's redemptive, redeeming mankind. It's a story of God creating man and, and a woman, placing them in the Garden of Eden for relationship with Him. We've been created for relationship. But along the way, Adam and Eve, they chose to do their own thing. They chose to sin. And as a result of that, this relationship for which they were created, the relationship with God was severed. And the, this, this fellowship was over. And, and the rest of the, of the Bible is a story of God's plan to redeem, to bring us back to a relationship with Him. And He does that through the, 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 the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus as He paid for the, the sins of mankind on the cross. And to restore us back together. But sin, when it came into this world, it brought spiritual death. And Christ was the one who brought us life again. But sin also brought physical death. It brought physical death to humans. It brought physical death to animals. It brings physical death to, to, to plant life as well. Death came into the world because of sin. And with that death came disease and, and tragedy and heartache and sorrow and brokenness. It has affected our relationships that we have with each other. It has affected our work. It has affected our spirituality, even our families. This curse came into the world. And listen, all these words that we just read here in verse 4, all these words of death and mourning and crying and pain are a result of the curse of sin. And John says this, hang on guys, because the day is coming when there will be no more death. No more pain, no more sorrow. It's going to be gone forever. The curse is gone. John MacArthur says this, the curse with all its painful and detestable ramifications will be overturned and erased forever. Pain, the agony of toil, sweat, thorns, disease, sorrow, and sin will have no place whatsoever in heaven. The Bible says that he will wipe away every, listen, oh, tear from their eye. What's that mean? Listen, church, be encouraged. In this place of heaven, there's, there will be no sorrow, listen, that is associated with being a human being. Being a human being means that we experience sorrow and pain and heartache. Listen to what Galatians 3, 13 says. It says this, Christ redeemed us. You see that? That's the story of the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Christ redeemed us from the what? Say it out loud. The curse of the law. How do you do that? By, look at it, becoming a curse for us. As you look at that, I want to just say, here, here's what happened on the cross. All the implications, the ramifications of the curse, death, pain, disease, all because of sin, 
Christ became to deliver us. That's what it says. He says, look at the verse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Jesus fulfilled the ultimate penalty of the, of that, for that curse. God died physically and spiritually for us. But he didn't stay dead. Three days later, he defeated sin, death in the grave, and he pulled the stinger out of the curse. And when we get to heaven, when we get there, folks, no more death, no more mourning, crying, or pain. You know, let me show you an application to this. Heaven will be a place of unending joy. Are you ready for some joy in your life? Are you ready for unending joy? Now, somebody comes and says, Rich, won't there be some sad memories from this life? In Isaiah chapter 65, it says this, For behold, I create new heavens and new earth. That's the same thing that John's talking about, right? But look what he says. And the former things shall not be, what? Remembered or come into mind. You say, well, Rich, are you telling me I won't have a memory when I get to heaven? No, I'm not saying that at all. What he's saying here is that by God's grace, all my past sins, all my mistakes and failures and sorrows that I will ever experience will not occupy my mind. By God's grace, they'll be lifted. They will not diminish heaven's joy at all. The joy of God and the joy of his people will be so overwhelming that it'll be as if those bad things never even happened. And you say, how can that happen? John MacArthur says this, as for how this will work out in the hearts and minds of the redeemed, Scripture simply does not tell us. We're promised only that God himself will dry our tears for now, it is enough to know that we can trust implicitly His infinite goodness, compassion, and mercy. We who truly know the Lord know we can trust Him, even with our unanswered questions. Man, I'm gonna, I need to keep moving, man. You guys need to listen faster because I'm taking more time than I thought I should. Let me keep going here. Look, look down here. Here's the third thing that's not going to be in heaven. No temple. Look what the verse says. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Now, you, you've got to realize and remember that for John, the Jewish people, especially of the Old Testament times and the New Testament, the temple is the centerpiece of their faith because the temple was the place that the glory of God was manifested. That's where God was. Matter of fact, in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, it says this, when the priest came out of the holy place, that's the temple, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the, the house of the Lord. So here it is. God's presence filled the temple. John says, hey, I got to heaven. I looked around and there's no temple there. Why? John says, well, there's no temple there because, listen, God's everywhere. God's presence is not uh, restricted to only the temple. God's presence is so glorious that we don't even need a sun or a moon. Now, that's remarkable, right? Now, some people have used this passage of Scripture to say, well, when we get to heaven, there will be no sun or moon. I do not believe that's what it's telling us. It's only saying that we do not need a sun or a moon. Now, let me take you back in your minds to go back, all the way back to the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. If we go to the first book in the Bible, the first chapter of the Bible, 
and we look at verse two and three, we get some insight. Take a look, here it is on your screen. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be, what? Light. And there was, what? Light. Do you know, do you know what's missing in those two verses? What's missing is the sun and the moon. They're, they're not there. God made light, listen to me, three days before he made the sun and the moon. God never needed a sun and a moon to light things up. God is light. Listen, when we get to heaven, the sun and the moon, I believe, are going to be there. And they're going to be doing the same thing that they've always done. They're going to be simply decorations created by God to display His glory and to reflect and reveal His presence, His light. We, the presence of God in that moment, when we get to heaven, is so real that we will not need a sun or a moon like we do now. Randy Alcorn says this, God himself will be the light source for the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, restoring the original pattern that existed in Genesis 1 before the creation of sun and moon. Light preceded the light holders, sun and moon. And apparently God's very being provided that light. So it will be again. Here's our third application here. Listen, heaven will be a place filled with God's presence. Now, let me ask you a question. Look at me here. Have you ever been completely just overwhelmed by God's presence? This happens to me on occasion, man. I just get overwhelmed with God's presence. Sometimes I, I was during worship and I'll be thinking, I'll be praising God and, and a tears form in my eyes and I think, man, how am I going to get up and preach after this? And, and sometimes it's just so, it's so wonderful, overwhelming. Let me, let me tell you, when you are in God's presence, everything else just starts to fade away. You know what I'm talking about, amen? You know. You can be walking literally through hell on earth. And you get into God's presence. Man, and the things of earth grow strangely dim. In the light of His glory and His grace. In Psalm 16, verse 11, we read, in your presence, there is fullness of, of what? Of joy. I, I love that word, jo uh, fullness, because you know what that word fullness means? It's the same word in Hebrew that it was used when you had just that Thanksgiving meal and you ate so much that you, know, you didn't dare want to step on the, the bathroom scale afterwards, right? You just ate so much and you, you're, you're, just, you're sitting at the table, you are so full, right? And you start waving that white napkin going, surrender, I surrender, I can't eat anymore. I can't do it anymore, I'm full. That's the word. And what the psalmist is saying, when we get into the presence of the Lord, man, we're just going to be waving, surrender, I surrender, Lord. I, you're, I'm in your presence. I'm so filled with your presence and the joy of your presence. I can't, for all eternity, I push him back from the table. I can't handle it anymore. It's so good. So wonderful, so full of joy. Let's, let's look at the fourth thing. It's not going to be in heaven. It's going to be no danger. No danger. Verse 25 says this, Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. Now, little interpretation here. I do not believe that when John says there's, that there will be no night there, that there will literally be no night there. I, I think that there's 
No more than I think that, by the way, that there's no sea. I think that the rest of the scriptures tell us that there will be bodies of water in heaven. And uh, so I, I think what he's talking about, this is a symbolic thing here. You have to realize what John, the culture from which John is writing. In John's day, night and darkness meant danger and evil. You never wanted to be caught outside the gates after dark because they closed the gates at dark because outside the gates, the, the walls of a city protected you from the danger and the evil <coughs> that was out there. Now, mo most of us uh, do, do not lock our house during the days if we're home, we're in and out of the house, we're doing stuff, and, unless you're paranoid, and that's another problem we could talk about later, but I guess I shouldn't should be careful. My wife sometimes locks the door and locks me out, but that's another story, right? Most of the time, we don't necessarily, if we're right around the house, we're not locking our doors during the day, but at night we do. Why? Because at nighttime, there's something about nightness that screams of danger and screams of, 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 of uh, evil. Bad things can happen at nighttime. There's an enemy that's out there. Listen to what John MacArthur says. He says this, there will be no rival to the glory or authority of God. What's he saying there? Satan's not there. There will be no rival to the glory or authority of God. The cosmic conflict of the ages will be finally ended forever. And God and his people will dwell in utter security. That's why he says there will be no night. And then he adds, the gates will never be closed. There's no need, reason to close gates because there's no enemy. There, there's no danger. Satan's not there anymore. But today, we live on this planet and we have an enemy. The Bible says that he goes around like a roaring lion, lion seeking whom he can devour. Let me give you an application, man. This place in heaven... Heaven will be a place of security. Frankly, as your pastor, I get tired of the effects that an enemy has on people's lives. People who live on this earth, you, you see it everywhere you go. You see the effects of the enemy with addiction. And, and conflict in marriage, and divorce, and pride, and abuse, and terrorism, and, and racism, and, and conflict between groups of people, even within nations. What is that? What are all these things? They're the effect of the enemy. But in heaven, in heaven, the enemy has been vanquished. The enemy has been thoroughly, utterly defeated, we will be secure. Amen. Let's look at that. Boy, we've got to hurry up here. here. Here's the next one. Here's our final one we'll look at. There will be no sin. Look at what verse 27 says. It says, nothing unclean will ever enter it. That is why it is so important for you and me, we have to realize this, for our sins not to be on us. That's why when we trust Christ as Lord and Savior, He takes that burden of sin, He, he lifts that away, He takes it away from us, He bears that, He bore that on the cross, and He gives us His righteousness. When God looks at you and me, He looks at you and me exactly as He looks at His Son Jesus. When He looks at He sees us as righteous. Because here is the verse, nothing unclean will be in heaven. We have to be clean, cleansed by the blood of Christ. Now, I, I got to just tell you, so I, I don't know about you, even though I'm clean positionally, I still struggle with sin in my life. And as a Christian, the thing that grieves me the most, as I live, not in heaven yet, but I live on this planet, earth, is my flesh. I want to please the Lord so much. 
I, I hunger and I long to, to honor him with my life. I, I want my thoughts, my desires to be in perfect alignment with him. But I'm going to be honest with you. The, there's lots of times that I feel as if I take one step forward in my walk with the Lord and I take two steps backwards. I feel like this flesh that I have, that you have, sometimes just weighs me down. I feel like Paul. And by the way, I am so grateful I praise God that, that under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, Paul wrote Romans chapter 7. It says what's in my heart. Listen to what he, he, what he, how he writes it in verse 18. He says this, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. That's a good place to say amen, right? I live in this world, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be the law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. As you look at that on the screen, what he's saying is, yeah, on the inside, I rejoice in God and in, in his righteousness. When I read the word, everything inside of me says yes, but look what he says in the next verse. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who's going to set me free? Who's going to do that? Well, fortunately, Paul answers his own question when he gets to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Chapter 15, beginning with verse 50. He says this, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. What's he saying? Paul says, I'm not sure I understand all this, but I'm telling you the truth. He says this, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Amen. Verse 52, he says this, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. And we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. Oh, here, listen. Oh, listen. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he closes it with this verse. Don't miss this. Therefore, therefore, my beloved brothers, listen, be steadfast, immovable. Just look at those words. Steadfast, immovable. Don't, what are you saying? Don't give up. Don't let your flesh get you down. What's got you down? Did you look at those words? Does depression, lust, anger, greed, What's the thing in your flesh that is always nagging you and always seeming to be winning? He says this, be steadfast, 
immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why, why, why? Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Look at me. Why is it not in vain? Listen, because he who began a good work in you, he who began a good work in me will complete it. Well, when's he going to complete it? In the day of Christ Jesus. When he takes us home to be with the Lord in heaven, where there will be no more sin, there will be no more enemy, uh, uh, Satan there. Listen, here's an application for you and me. It's an encouraging one. Heaven will be a place of purity the battle with our flesh will be over and heaven will be a place of purity. Oh, I praise God for that. Jesus, when he died on the cross, he, listen, listen, he removed the penalty of our sin. He made us righteous. He take, took away all of our unrighteousness, makes us righteous. And as we live out on this life, Jesus continually removes not just the penalty of sin on the cross, but he removes the power of sin that we battle with as we battle our flesh. But praise God, one day when we go to heaven, he will remove the presence of sin. And all these things that you and I battle with are not going to be there. Oh, that's not going to be in heaven at all. Praise be to God. Listen, these things are not going to be in heaven. You're going to have to come back next week and the following weeks to find out what's going to be in heaven. But as I wrap up, I want to ask you three questions very quickly. Here's the first question. Are you certain you're going to be in heaven? Oh, it's going to be a glorious place. No separation. Presence of God. Oh, it's fullness of joy. Oh, are you certain you're going to be there? This same John who told us about the promise of heaven with Jesus in John 14 last week. He talked about the, a preview of heaven this week. Elsewhere in 1 John 3, or 1 John rather, he writes, he writes uh, that he who has the Son has life. And he who does not have the Son does not have life. Do you have the Son? You say, well, Rich, how do I have the Son? What does that mean? To have the Son means that you recognize that you're a sinner, that you've been separated from God because of your sin. And you believe that Jesus is God. He is the way, the, pro the, 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 way, the, 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 the truth, and the life, as we learned last week. He, and you trust Him. You believe that he died for your sins. You trust him with your life and you follow his, his best for your life. Do you? Do you have the son? I have the son. Oh, I struggle. It's sometimes it's, it's one step forward and two steps back, but I have the son. Do you have the son? If you don't, today's the day. You simply... Ask him, just say right where you are right now, Lord, I trust you. I believe you're God and that you died on the cross for my sin. Forgive me of my sin. Just say that to him. I entrust my life to you. Help me as I live out this life. Listen, when you do that, you have the son. He who has the son has life. It's certain, certain that you'll be with heaven, with God in heaven. That's the first question. Are you certain that you're going to be in heaven? Here's the second question. Are your current priorities and your current passions reflective of the fact that, that you are going to be in heaven one day? Do you have an eternal perspective that is being lived out in this world as you parent kids and you're married, or you're single, and you're, and you're struggling to get out of debt, and you're, you're managing your finances, and you're dealing with conflict, do you have that in eternal perspective? Here's the third question I want you to, to puzzle with. Are there people that you care about 
that you love that don't know about heaven. They don't know how to get there. How might God use you in their life to say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Some of us need to have conversations with some of those people that we love and we care about. And I want to encourage you to be praying about it. The Spirit of God is inside. You can't, you're not bold enough. You don't know what to say. I get that. Hey, Christ's Spirit in you, working through you, can lead you to have those conversations. And you can share about the confidence you have that one day you'll be with Him. Not because you're a good person, not because you give money to the church, not because you care for the poor, not because you, you go to church or even watch online. Nope, none of those reasons. But because you have the Son. Will you bow with me in prayer? Oh Jesus, we just pray that right now you'd be working in people's lives as you want to work. This is your time, Lord. The whole service has been, but this is the time we want to listen closely to your spirit. Lord, if anybody's listening right now and they are not certain they're going to heaven, Lord, may they place their faith and trust in you, simply admitting they're sinners, believing that you're God, Jesus, who died on the cross and rose from the dead to, to deal with their sin, and then committing their life to you. Pray they do that. And Lord, for all of us, that we would live this life with an eternal perspective. And Lord, those things that we've got wrong, we're all trying to amass wealth and what mass possessions or whatever else is in our life. Lord, we, we just want to pause. Lord, may everything we do, our conversation, our finances, our relationships, our interactions, everything, conversations, reflect an eternal perspective. And Lord, give us the boldness to have conversations with people who the, we care about and we love who don't know their way to heaven. Give us opportunities, Lord, that we might be able to do that. Lord, we thank you for heaven and we thank you for these things that are not in heaven that we've learned about today. God, we love you. May we enjoy the fullness of your presence as we live out our lives this week. And Lord, whatever's going on in people's lives like right now, I want to pray you bless them and encourage them, strengthen them, comfort them. Give them all the grace that they need to battle to what's going on in their lives and what's going on with their health or, or their spiritual life, whatever's going on. Lord, bless them and may they be encouraged by your word and by your spirit this morning. And we pray these things, God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching Hessel Online. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can stay up to date on the latest content and share this with a friend. If you've been blessed by our ministry and want to support us financially, you can give through our app or click on the link in the description below. Thanks again for watching and may God bless you.